Well, you may be seated. If you have a Bible, if you would please open to the book of Amos. Amos. Now I know when you think of Amos, you think of famous Amos. Not the same guy. This Amos is famous, but not for his chocolate chip cookies. This Amos is famous. He was a shepherd in Israel back when and was used of God to be a mighty prophet. And in chapter 3, I want you to see a passage that I think has great relevance to our text in 1 John. I love this book of Amos. In the setting, the context for chapter 3, Amos had been announcing God's judgment on the nations. Now, if you're a Gentile, or if you're a Jew, and you've been attacked by these nations for your whole lifetime and the whole history of the nation, you're glad to hear that God is going to judge the nations. Well, after he goes through roundly talking about God's judgment on nation after nation after nation, all the nations around Israel, he then points out how judgment's going to fall on Judah and Israel as well. That part they didn't like. So notice what Amos says here to drive his point home in verse 1. Hear this word which the Lord has spoken against you, sons of Israel, against the entire family which he brought up from the land of Egypt. You only have I chosen among all the families of the earth, therefore I will punish you for all your what? Iniquities. Iniquities, sins, failures to do what God has said, violations of God's clear commands. Then verse three is the instructive primary verse I want you to see. Do two men walk together unless they have made an appointment? Now that is a rhetorical question that he asks that leads into a series of rhetorical questions, so let's take a quick look at those. Does a lion roar in the forest when he has no prey? Does a young lion growl from his den unless he has captured something? Does a bird fall into a trap on the ground when there is no bait in it? Does a trap spring up from the earth when it captures nothing at all? If a trumpet is blown in a city, will not the people tremble? If a calamity occurs in the city, has not the Lord done it? And the answer is clearly yes or no, right? But they're, they're clear on answers. These are rhetorical questions. You don't have to sit there and ponder these too much. What he is saying is, I am giving you things that have a very clear cause and effect. There is a cause and there is an effect. Now, notice what he says next in verse 7 and 8. Surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret counsel to his servants, the prophets. A lion has roared, who will not fear? The Lord God has spoken, who can but prophesy? What Amos is saying is really profound. He's declaring God's prophecies of judgment against the nation, but the people didn't like the message. Now, what do you do when you don't like a message? You attack the messenger, and then you claim that his message isn't true. And this is what the nation had been doing for prophet after prophet after prophet. And just like we are prone to do. Do I hear an amen? Yeah, it's true, isn't it? We are so prone to attack the messenger if we don't like the message. So Amos asks these cause and effect questions to drive a point home in verse 7 and 8 to say, since God has spoken, cause, the prophet must proclaim, effect. You see what I'm saying? We're not just saying this of our own accord. We didn't make this stuff up. God has delivered this message to us. We are obligated to give the message out. It must be done. The first question establishes how you know the prophets are speaking for God. Do two men walk together unless they have made an appointment? Walk together, that means to be in lockstep, to be in agreement, to be on the same path, heading the same direction, having the same goals. You understand this idea of walking together? 
It's fellowship. We were talking about last week. Walking together is to be in fellowship with one another. As we said last week, it's a relationship, a partnership, a companionship, a stewardship. God is walking that way and I'm walking with him. Now, because I'm walking together with God and you're not, I have to point that out. And you don't like it. Now, this idea of walking together is an incredible word picture that's used throughout the Bible. For example, in Genesis 5, 24, you remember when there, there was this genealogy of the people who had been born from Adam on down and how long they lived? And it describes a guy named Enoch. And in verse 24, Genesis 5, Enoch walked with God and he was not for God took him. Oh, wouldn't that be a great way to go? We were talking about that, our elders were in prayer this morning and I was talking about that. I said, I've always had the dream, I'm at Magic Mountain and I'm on one of these really crazy, super fast roller coasters and it goes off this really steep hill and it goes over the next hill and right as it's about to crest the hill where your stomach goes, woo, right then I want the rapture to take place. <laughs> Wouldn't that be awesome? You're just going with God and bam, he takes you. How exciting. Man, that's what happened with Enoch because he fellowshiped with God. He walked with God in agreement. Genesis 6 verse 9, Noah walked with God. He was a righteous man, blameless in his time. Genesis 17 1, Abram was 99 years old. The Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless. Notice there is a description of what that walk looks like. It's, it's righteous, it's holy, it's blameless. In Genesis 48, 15, Jacob blesses Joseph and he says, the God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked. See, Abraham and Isaac understood that God was watching at all times and they walked before him, wanting to please him. Or Micah 6, 8, the verse you're so familiar with. He has told you, O oh man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you? But to do justice, to love kindness, and to what? Walk humbly with your God. To walk with him, to fellowship with him, to partner with him, to be in agreement with him. And Amos says, how is it possible for two to walk together unless they have made an appointment. See, what do you mean by that? Well, he's describing this reality of genuine fellowship being that we have agreed on a time and a place where we're meeting. We are going to the same place. I have chosen to walk with you. I want to walk with you. So I've made this appointment an agreement that we will be there together. So the prophet is saying, God's judgment is God's prophetic word. And the reason I'm giving this judgment is because God gave it to me. So Amos' question ultimately is saying, can a prophet be in genuine fellowship with God if he doesn't agree with God as to what God wants said? You catch that? We have to agree with what God says is true. It's not what we feel, what we think, it's not what psychologists tell us. What is really true biblically that God says, even if God declares judgment on the nation? Well, how do you know if you're of one mind with God? Well, what the context tells us in Amos is the prophets who were walking with God were the ones who agreed with what he had already revealed in scripture. Take the time now, but just write down chapter two, verse seven and eight. In that text, he describes sexual perversion that was going on in Israel. Well, the things that he described were in direct violation of, of Leviticus chapter 18, verses six through 18. So when he says, God's gonna judge you because of this, he's saying it because it was clearly revealed in scripture before. So the prophet is in agreement with what God has said before. If a prophet comes along in the future and says something contradictory to God's word, that person is what kind of a prophet? A false prophet. And according to Deuteronomy, they should be stoned. In chapter three, verses 10 and 11, the Israelites were guilty of violence and robbery, which are clear violations of a number of Old Testament laws. 
So the test of a prophet is, does he walk with God? Is he in true fellowship with God? Does his message agree with what God has said before? And has he agreed ahead of time? That's the cause. The cause is we have an appointment. The effect is I walk with God, no matter what he says. And I keep doing that as a pattern of my life. That's what Amos is describing. So with that in mind, turn to 1 John. And I want you to see how John is gonna take that same concept and he's going to apply it to tests of genuine fellowship to find out if you really do have fellowship with God. Are there a lot of people in the world who claim they have fellowship with God? Do they all have fellowship with God? No, some have been deceived and some are deceivers themselves. So as we look to 1 John, John wants us to walk away when all is said and done. If we are living out what he describes here, we can have an absolute assurance that we have genuine fellowship with God. So we looked at the prologue for several weeks in verses one through four of chapter one. We saw the apostles' proclamation and the apostles' purpose. They were proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. They were talking about Jesus, how he had come, he was incarnated, he was tasted, touched, seen, felt, he was, he was real. There was spirit and flesh together incarnate. He was not some mystery, he was not a phantom, he was real. And he is the focal point of their proclamation and you can trust their proclamation proclamation because they saw it, felt it, everything. And then their purpose was that there would be genuine fellowship with God, with one another, and that would lead to unbelievable joy. So I was thinking about that because I often don't see the joy I think ought to be in the life of believers. Should Christians be joyful? I mean, not only we've been commanded to be joyful, how often? Always rejoice in the Lord, and if that wasn't enough to get the point across, and again I say rejoice. So Christians ought to be rejoicing. Christians ought to be celebrating. Christians ought to be, you just can't wipe the smile off your face. No matter what's going on. Why is that? Well, I was thinking about that. Because of the contrast between now that you're a believer and when you were not a believer. And someday I would like you to just go down and make as many contrasts as you can. I just came up with just a few, just really quick, this week. Before I was spiritually dead, now I'm spiritually alive. Before I was a sinner, now I'm a saint. Before I had a sin nature, now I have a new nature. Before I was a child of the devil, now I'm a child of God. I was condemned, now I'm free or justified. I was guilty, now I'm not guilty. I was gonna receive wrath, now I've received mercy and grace. I was going to hell, now I'm going to heaven. I had no hope, now I have a hope that will not disappoint. I had no inheritance, now I have an eternal inheritance protected by by the power of God that can never be taken away. Awesome, I was powerless over sin. I now have the power of the Holy Spirit. I could not understand spiritual things. Now I have the illumination of the Spirit. I was in bondage, now I'm in freedom. I was a slave to sin, now I'm a slave to righteousness. Is that enough things to make you smile? Brothers and sisters, that's what he's talking about. That is fellowship with God. That's who you are in Christ. That's what you have. That's why what you have with God, the unbeliever does not have, cannot have, apart from that gospel he shared in the first four verses. Our fellowship is dependent upon Jesus Christ. So having looked at that prologue with the focus on the gospel of Jesus, fellowship, and joy, the rest of the epistle from now to the end is gonna keep cycling through three tests. Three tests, the first, there, there'd be three different tests and three different times it's gonna come up, three cycles. Each time having these tests, question answered, do we have eternal life? Are we saved? How can we be sure by these tests? And each time, each cycle, he's gonna go through a moral test, a social test, and a doctrinal test. And so he's gonna do it, and he's gonna come back to it, and he's gonna come back to it, and then he's gonna end with this absolute assurance that if you pass those tests, you know that you're the real thing. You know that you're genuine. You know that you have true fellowship with God, and you can die with a smile on your face because you know that you know that you know that you have eternal life. Isn't that a glorious thing to think about? 
I'm telling you, my friends, there are religious people all over the world that do not have that assurance, cannot have that assurance, even according to their own belief system. They're always wondering, they're always questioning. You can know that you know that you know. I love that. So, with that in mind, I want to look at with you at the moral test in chapter 1, verse 5, through chapter 2, verse 6. This is the test of obedience. So let's take a look, and I'm going to read that whole passage, and we're going to come back, and we're going to get all the way through one verse, all right? So, this is the message we have heard from him and announced to you, that God is what? And in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus his son cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not, what? Sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for how many? Those of the whole world. By this we know that we have come to know him if we, what? Keep his commandments. The one who says I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word in him, the love of God has truly been perfected. By this we know that we are in him. The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. Do you catch the morality of all of that? Do you see all these different things and there's these contrasts back and forth? Somebody says something, but the other person does it. They're not just hearers, they are doers. And this contrast goes back and forth. Some of it seems repetitive, but it's not. He digs deeper and deeper and deeper into the reality of the lost person who thinks they're right with God versus the person who really is right with God. Now, when I was in high school, just, man, so long ago, there was a uh, standard or criterion for test scores. Remember that test score? On a test, if you scored 90 to 100, you got what? An A, and 80 to 90 was a B, 70 to 80 was a C, 60 to 70. You had to get 59 or below to fail. Not a real challenging scoring system. I went to seminary after college, and they changed it on me. 96 to 100 was an A. Not a, not a lot of margin for error. And you had to have at least a C minus to pass, which required a score of 78. So anything below 78, essentially you failed. Is that a little bit tougher schedule? A little bit tougher standard? John presents an entirely different standard. In this, he says, the standard for fellowship with God is moral perfection. Well, I hope you have the same reaction to that that I did, and you'll begin to understand the glorious gospel that sets us free. Let's look at the standard or the criterion for true fellowship with God in verse five. This is the message we have heard from him and announced to you that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. Now, John is writing this as if it's absolute truth, and of course, other people were coming through town and proclaiming things that they said were true. There were all the Roman gods and all the different things available, the different deities of the day. There was all the Gnostic heresies that were still in an incipient beginning form, but they were growing and developing over the next century, and we talked about a lot of that in our intro. Well, how do we know this is God's standard and not just John's? Look how he says it. This is the message. Now that idea when John says this is, it's a specific Greek phrase that he uses in chapter three, verse 11, 323, 5, 3, 11, 14, 2 John 6. He uses this over and over 
to emphasize a message that continues. This is, what I'm, what I'm about to tell you is a message, and it's the continuing message. This is not a message that needs to be replaced. This is a message that it will be what you need as the foundation for everything else I'm going to tell you. And he starts with this to lay a foundation. He says this is the message. Now this word only occurs here and in verse 11 of chapter 3 in the entire New Testament. And the focus of the message is the content. He's saying, this content I'm about to give you is the message you need to hear. This message is an ongoing message. This is a message you need to think about, meditate upon, reflect upon, analyze your life according to. This message is vital. And John and the apostles didn't make this message up. Notice what he says. This message we have heard from who? From him. Now, who him? Is that good English? Who be him? Well, there's things in grammar called near and remote antecedents. And the most recent antecedent, the closest him to this word is Jesus Christ in verse three. So what John is saying is, we apostles didn't make this up. We don't have a record anywhere in the Bible of Jesus actually saying these exact words until here in 1 John. But these were the words of Jesus that he shared with the apostles to lay a foundation for the gospel. This is critical. This is absolutely essential as I'm gonna try to explain to you. Let me ask you this. Was Jesus qualified to describe God? Uniquely, wasn't he? He could uniquely give us the exact nature of God like no one else. For example, in John 1.18, no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him. He has exegeted him is the Greek word. He has brought to our understanding who he really is. He has brought out from these facts the reality of who God is. And so John says, this is the message, and then I love this, we have heard, once again, perfect tense, we heard it and we can't stop hearing it. We heard it and we have forever been changed by it. These words just keep resonating in our mind. They resound in our ears. We cannot stop hearing this message. Would you agree that this must be an important message? If John says, this is the message that we apostles just can't get over, and the more we think about it, the more it affects every area of our life, and it sets the standard for us to know that we truly have fellowship with God. We have not been deceived. We are not phonies. We are not liars. We're the real deal. We are a demonstration of the power of God. So this message has an ongoing impact in their lives. And then he says, and we announce it to you. Now, in verse three and uh, two and three, he had a different Greek word for the word proclaim. This is similar with a different prefix. This means, interestingly enough, to announce it again. We, we have no problem saying this to you again. Kind of reminds me of Peter when he wrote in First Peter and he says, uh, I, I'm, I wanna stir you up by way of what? Reminder, I have no problem doing this, he says. It's actually good for you if I do this. The Apostle Paul said similar things. It is really important that certain message become foundational to our lives, our beliefs, our a sense of assurance. And this one is critical. It is foundational to everything else John will say in the rest of this book. Therefore, it ought to be studied intensely and meditated upon deeply. Now these are gonna be simple words and you go, yeah, I've heard that before. John is saying, I know you've heard it before and I have no problem saying it again, it's that important. I want you to take it to a new level. I want you to reflect on this because this is the standard of having fellowship with God. This is the criterion by which we measure if somebody is truly walking with God. If you understand and agree to this, you have assurance. If you don't, it's impossible to have assurance. Does that make sense? Then what is this message? 
What did Jesus say to the apostles that was so important? Look at it, it's real simple. God is what? Light, and in him there is no darkness at all. Now that has two parts, it seems like two messages, but the word message is singular. It's not two messages, it's two sides of the same message. There's a positive side and there's a negative side because John really wants them to get this. Jesus wanted them to get it. So the first part, God is light. Now, you can just read that simply and move on, or you can study this, and I tell you, it is fascinating to understand what that phrase means. God is light. Now, in this context, he's not saying that God created light, or God has light, or God shines light on you, although those are all true. What does he say? He is light. This is his very nature. This is his essence, this is who he is. Now, I did a search, and I encourage you to use the Logos Bible software that we paid for so you could all have it for free. Have you downloaded that yet? Four of you, that's not a good. We paid a lot of money so all of you could have this Logos Bible software so you could study it. By the way, it also has their own television network of wholesome Christian movies and things you can also watch. So you really want to download that and use that. If you don't know how to do it, call the church office and somebody will explain to you how to do that because I don't know how to, I, I have it, I don't know how it works. All right, so, so I did this word study on God is blank. Because I just wanted to see, you think about that, right? God is and all the different things that God is. And as I read through it, and I printed a bunch of verses on the discussion questions for you, but here's a few that I came with, just real quick. God is with you. God is witness between you and me. God is not a man that he should lie or a son of man that he should repent. God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. God is a dwelling place. God is gracious and compassionate. God is a righteous judge. God is our refuge and strength. God is king of all the earth. God is in the heavens. He does whatever he pleases. What does that mean? He is absolutely sovereign over all things at all times. I love that one. God is the Lord. God is righteous. God is the one who justifies. God is faithful. And when you finally get to Hebrews 12, 29, God is a consuming fire. Wow, is that the word picture you usually have of God? God is. John uses other words to describe the nature of God. In the Gospel of John, here is his description of God's very nature, John 4, 24. God is spirit. The nature or essence of God is that he is a spirit being. God the Father does not have a flesh and bone body. He is a spirit. You can't see him. If you did see him, you would die, by the way. So John uses that phrase. But in 1 John 4, 8 and 16, he also says God is what? Love. God is love. It doesn't just say that God loves. He says that God is love. He is the consummate definition of love. He is always loving in everything that he does. So God is spirit, God is light, and God is love. John uses all three of those. But John chooses here to start the book, God is Light. I love it when you think about this, because not only is God light, Psalm 104 verse two says he clothes himself in light, and 1 Timothy 6, 15 to 16 says he dwells in unapproachable light. So you've got a God who is light, wearing a robe of light, living in unapproachable light, that's a lot of light. You, got, you see what I'm saying here? This is not like light yogurt, this is light. What does that mean? What does light mean? And why would John choose that word to launch tests of genuine fellowship? Well, I looked it up, every one of them. There's 200, over 200 references in the Bible to the word light. So I read through all of those, trying to get some sense of what all this could possibly mean. And I came up with four different, distinct uses of this word, and I want you to see where this takes us. First of all, in Genesis chapter one, there is physical light. You know, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was formless and void, and the darkness was over, da, da, da. And then God said, let there be light, and there was. 
And then he established light for the day and darkness for the light. And he had the light bearers that were put into the sky, the sun and the stars, etc. And so God gave us physical light. Well, there's benefits from that, right? If they turned all the lights off right now, what would happen? You wouldn't be able to see me. What a tragedy that might be. <laughs> yeah, you'd be in darkness. Would you feel secure in perfect darkness? I mean, if, if you get up, and by the way, the older you get, do you find that you need more light to be able to read and see and feel safe and secure? So light has the benefit of making my path known and giving me that sense of security in my steps. So there's a benefits to physical light. But the word light is also used metaphorically. And one of the metaphorical uses of light is intellectual light. This would be understanding, or you might associate the word enlightenment. This is where God's light enables you to comprehend things intellectually. You think of that, you think of Psalm 43, verse 3. Oh, send out your light and your truth. Let them lead me. So he's saying light and truth are synonyms. That when God gives me truth, it directs me, it leads me. Psalm 119, verse 130. The unfolding of your words gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. So God's light causes people who are simple to become wise. They start to understand things. Proverbs 6, verse 23. The commandment is a lamp and the teaching is light. So there's intellectual truths that God gives us that are light. And by the way, God is by nature truth, isn't he? Jesus himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He was truth incarnate. He was absolute truth, and God is always true. God is always true and cannot lie. Satan by nature is a what? A liar. That's what he does. He has lied from the beginning and that's all he does. And the way he gets people down the wrong path toward hell is through lies, deception, trickery, debauchery. So that's the difference. So light can be physical light. It can be intellectual light. Thirdly, it can be the incarnate light of Jesus who brings life. This is light that produces life. And I love this. Jesus is the light that brings eternal life. John chapter one. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. Then verse four, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. He goes on to describe how the light shines in the darkness. The darkness did not comprehend it. That's the intellectual side they were blinded to. There came a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify about the light so that all might believe through him. John was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. And who is the light? Jesus. There was the true light, Jesus, which coming into the world enlightens every man. So Jesus is that light, but John 8, verse 12, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in the darkness, remember see this contrast, darkness and light, but will have the light of life. So there is a light that produces life. It causes the dead to come alive. You are transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light, from Satan to Jesus. You go from death to life. So that is one way metaphorically that light is used to refer to life. Matthew 4 says the same thing, referring to Jesus when he came. And he came and he withdrew into Galilee and this fulfilled a prophecy. And in Matthew 4, 16, it says, the people who were sitting in darkness saw a great light and those who were sitting in the land in shadow of death, upon them a light dawned. You catch that? You were dead and that light shone on you and produced life. That light was Jesus incarnate. The incarnate light is the one who can give you life. Are you thankful for that? That's why he came. Every last one of us were dead. Jesus, the great light, came to bring life to people in the shadow of death through the gospel. Second Corinthians 4 describes the same thing. And all of a sudden, the lights got brighter. 
that Satan wants to veil the eyes of the unbelieving so they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ to his image of God. And in verse six, for God who said light shall shine out of the darkness is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. Satan wants to keep people from the light. He does not want them to know that there is a light that can produce life. He wants people to die in their sins and go to hell. But thanks be to God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, our eyes have been made open. Are you thankful for that? Jesus is the light, and he has given us the gospel that brings eternal life. But there's one more metaphorical use of the word light, and this one I think is the one that's germane to our text. Although all of those do pertain, this is the one, and it's moral light. Moral light. John Phillips in his commentary said this, a wonderful property of light is that it cannot be defiled. Even though it passes, say, through a glass of muddy water, light is not defiled. Moreover, light can and most certainly does reveal defilement. You catch that? You cannot defile light. You cannot change it. You can't do anything to it. It is what it is, and it passes right through stuff, and it stays pure. That is God. He is morally pure 100% of the time. Yet, he shines the light on our immorality. There is nothing hidden from his sight. That light shines and that light of moral purity, holiness and righteousness is God's glory shining down upon us. Light is good, darkness is evil, light is purity, holiness and righteousness. Now mark this, this is critically important. Light is purity, holiness and righteousness as defined by God. Now why do I say that? Because don't we live in a day where people say there are no absolutes? There is no such thing as right or wrong and you can just say whatever you wanna be, you can self-identify as this or that and you're not right or wrong and you can take a math test and it doesn't matter what your answer is, what do you feel about it? No, 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 folks, nobody lives that way. That's not reality. That is some bizarre world of dreams that people have who don't deal with reality very often. Do you believe in a thing called gravity? No, I don't, I don't think, I just personally don't feel that that's accurate. Then jump off the Empire State Building, let's see what happens. No, there are realities out there, there are truths that are there, and the light shines on that. Listen to what it says in Isaiah 5, verse 20. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who substitute darkness for light and light for darkness, who substitute bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Is that happening in our culture? Everything's being redefined. And it's even happening in the swimming championships of the NCAA. It is just ridiculous nonsense that people who need help, we're having to be forced to say that this is normal, this is right. It's not right, it's wrong. It is unbiblical, it is ungodly, it is sinful. John 3, 19 through 21, this is the judgment that the light, Jesus, and the truth of the gospel has come into the world and men loved the darkness, that would be error, false religion, immorality, sin, rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. Why don't they like the light? Because they love their sin. That's what John 3.19 is saying. It goes on in verse 20, for everyone who does evil hates the light, does not come to light for fear that his deeds will be exposed, but he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. Unbelievers reject Jesus because they love sin more. They hate the light because it exposes the very thing that they love as evil. But those whom Jesus has caused to be born again, who turn from their sin, embrace the light, and walk in it, they are classified, characterized as those who practice the truth. They walk in the light. Proverbs 4.18, the path of the righteous is like the light of dawn that shines brighter and brighter until the full day. Philippians 2.14 and 15, do all things without grumbling or disputing. You know what, that's a sermon right there. You could just say those words and walk out and everybody would just fall on their face in tears. Do all things without grumbling and disputing. Anybody violated that one this week? (laughs) Stop bothering me, that just makes me grumble and Do all things without grumbling and disputing so that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you appear as lights 
in the world. When we walk in the light of God's morality and we are like him, when we demonstrate that righteousness, it has an impact on the watching world. And they see us as lights. Now, do they like it? No. They're like cockroaches when you turn the light on in your garage at night and they just go running and scattering. In fact, they don't like you because of what you say to them, but it's necessary. It's critical. So notice back in 1 John now. We are to walk in the light. Look at verse six of chapter one. If we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we, what's the word? Walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have what? Fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus' his son cleanses us from all sin. He's describing a lifestyle here, a lifestyle of obedience. What is a telltale sign that somebody truly has fellowship with the God who is light? They walk in light. They're growing in purity. They are becoming progressively more and more sanctified. Are they perfect? No, we'll get into that later. And we're gonna look more into that next week and the weeks after, because it's gonna take a while. These verses you're very familiar with in verses six through 10, I think you've missed a lot over the years because as I've been studying this, I'm just blown away all the things that that I'm seeing in here that I've just missed over the years. In 1 John chapter two, verse three and following, those who walk in the light keep his commandments. In verse five, they keep his word. So I believe John is using the word light here in 1 John 1, five, primarily focusing on moral light. Now why do I believe that? Because if you read the rest of the section down through chapter two, you will see he keeps talking about light, darkness, light, darkness, and when he mentions darkness, he keeps referring to sin, sin, sins, over and over and over again. Darkness clearly refers to sin, then light must refer to what? Holiness, purity, righteousness. Now, here's a tough question, you ready? Why? would John start a section on fellowship by describing the fact that God is absolutely holy instead of saying God is love, which he mentions in chapter four. Why start with holiness? Is that a fair question? Let me take a shot at it. God's light of holiness is the critical foundation to the gospel. If you do not understand that God is holy, you will not understand the gospel. It'll never make sense to you. What are you saying? If you don't have the law exposing your what? Sin, your failure to keep the law, you won't understand gospel. If you don't understand the bad news, you won't be grateful for the good news. If you don't understand darkness, you won't understand light. If you don't understand our problem, that all human beings have a problem with sin, which leads to God's wrath, if you don't understand that, you'll never really understand and appreciate God's solution of a perfect substitutionary sacrifice, which provides not only forgiveness of all sin, but imputes righteousness. You have to understand this one first or the other one never makes sense. If you start by saying that God is love, listen to what people will say. A God of love would never send anyone to hell. You ever heard that one? A God of love is obligated to forgive. I mean, for heaven's sake, I can forgive people. God certainly is required to forgive. A God of love will accept anyone. A God of love will surely forgive me. A God of love wouldn't kill his only son. What a heinous doctrine you Christians believe in. Why do they say those things? They don't understand that God is light. But if you start by saying that God is light, the discussion of sin, darkness, and light, righteousness, makes perfect sense. God who is light is perfectly justified in sending people to the darkness of hell if they prefer darkness to light. Does that make sense? If you don't start there, you can't get there. 
It makes sense of our need to be forgiven and, our, and to be radically changed in order to come to God's kingdom. It saves us from our tendency to blame God. We often blame God and criticize him in times of trouble and need, and we argue and ask the question, why does God do this? Did I deserve this? God is light, does he ever do anything wrong? Then why would you ever question? It helps us understand the moral test for true fellowship, and it makes us want to take it. D. Martin Lloyd-Jones said it this way, if we start with the holiness of God, we shall find that all the false claims of fellowship with God are immediately exposed. There is nothing that exposes the false so much as standing face to face with a holy God. And my dear friends, all of us someday will stand face to face with the God who is light. If you walk in darkness, you do not have fellowship with God. If you walk in the light, it's a sign that you do. So Jesus' crucial message was God is light. God is holy. He is set apart. He is purity. But then the second half is, and in him there is no darkness at all. Literally, the Greek text says, and darkness in him is not Not one. Whoa, there is absolutely no darkness whatsoever. There's not a trace. He is absolutely sinless. Why not just say God is light? What are we used to in our culture? Dimmer switches. (laughs) Shadows. Up here right now, there's a light shining in my face and right behind me is a shadow. Because God is light and his glory is everywhere at all times. When God shines, can there be a shadow? No, there is no shadow. There is no gray. There is no dimmer. I mean, I I can take my phone right here and you can take your phone. You probably do this from time to time. You pull up here and then you play with the, the, you know, the different value. Do I have a lot of light, a little bit of light, a little bit less light? It all depends on the setting and my eyes and what's pleasing to me. This would have been shocking to the people of that day. You know, even the sun has dark spots on it. What's he saying? You can't rationalize sin. You can't explain it away. You can't justify it. God is what? Light. And in him, there is no darkness at all. There is no variation or shifting shadow. He's not capricious. He doesn't change his mind because you came up with a good explanation. If he says it's wrong, it's what? It's wrong, period. This is not complicated. He's not like a smartphone. He is radiant, brilliant light 100% of the time and he takes no pleasure in wickedness. Psalm five, four through six says, So many texts, Habakkuk 1.13, your eyes are too pure to approve evil. You cannot look on wickedness with favor. Could you imagine being a Roman person at that time in that area and receiving this, realizing the kinds of gods they believed in who were mostly pathetic, immoral, disgusting beings who changed their mind day after day, who manipulated and lied and cheated, and all of a sudden they say, no, no, the true God, the only God, is a God who 100% of the time is always perfectly sinless, and they're going, that's not our God. And by the way, the Gnostics didn't believe that either because they believed there were multiple gods and there was really a really good God and a really bad God and there was dualism, which was why they could justify sinning because that was only their flesh that did it, not their spirit. And John says, that's not true. God is light. There's no darkness at all. Why do we come up with a God like that? interesting album by a group called Jethro Jethro Tull. It was a British group in the 60s and 70s. They had an album called Aqualung and inside the cover it says this, in the beginning man created God and in the image of man created he him. We are prone to design an idolatrous God in our image. Romans 1 describes the same thing. So John speaks with absolute clarity. It's not true. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Amen?
That's the foundation. Since he is that way, for me to claim that I am walking with him, I've got to be going the same direction. My lifestyle needs to reflect I've got an appointment with him there and I can't justify anything else. Do you see where he's going with this? We'll look into that more next week. We'll take some time and analyze the argument about what we say versus how we walk and I think it's gonna be very challenging and encouraging at the same time. So let me ask you two questions. Is the foundation of your fellowship with God the fact that he is light? Do you approach a God who is perfectly holy and know that you're not? On what basis do you approach him? I hope your answer is the Sunday school answer. What is it? Jesus. It's Jesus. And the second question, are you proclaiming that message to your family and friends? So many people you know and love, so many intelligent, highly educated people believe that they can somehow get to God because God has a dimmer switch and somehow he's gonna grade on a curve, and I'm better than Hitler, so I'm in. And God says, no, I'm light, and in me there is no darkness at all. Jesus says, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. That's the standard. What's the answer? Jesus. Bad news, God is light. Good news, God, light, became man to bring us life. Are you thankful? Father, thank you. Thank you for the gospel. Thank you for reminding us of what true fellowship is. As we dive further into this, I pray that you might expose anything in our lives that would contradict that message, that we might grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We might become progressively more holy, set apart unto you, useful in your hands, that like the apostles, we could proclaim this life-changing truth to the world around us. Thank you, Lord, for saving us in Jesus' name.